Well, this is the last of our series, in our series of um, Who Me? And essentially today, what I'm doing is I'm taking um, my inspiration from all of these photos and asking the question of, about it, asking that question of who, who us? Us, because for every me, there is a collective, and that is us. What is it that God is calling us to do and us to be? Well, there's this uh, story, it goes like this, of an elderly man sitting in a rocking chair next to his grandson. And uh, he was sitting out on, a, on the veranda in the middle of a, a little town. And a man came up to him and said, Hey, sir, you've obviously been around here for a while. Can you tell me, what's this town like? And he said to the man, the visitor, he said, um, oh, why don't you just explain to me what your town is like? And he goes, oh, the place where I live. He says, it's amazing that people care for each other. They're always there looking out for each other. Everybody rallies together, a great community spirit. And in doing so, we've got a, a wonderful community. And he goes, hmm, he said, you know what? That sounds a little bit like this town that you've asked about. And so with that, the man left. And uh, another man walks up, asks the same question. said, sir, can you tell me, what is this town like? And uh, with that, the man started to explain his town. He says, yeah, in my town, he said, people are nasty. He said, you know, backbiting, gossiping, never do anything for each other, always looking out for each other, being selfish. And the elderly man says, you know what? That's a little bit like this town as well. And with that, his grandson turned to him and he said, granddad, he said, We've had two questions that are the same, but you've answered differently. How is it that you've given different answers? And he said, well, to be quite honest, uh, you'll always get what you expect. You'll always get what you expect. And uh, for the man who anticipated his community to be warm and embracing, that's what he was going to get. For somebody who anticipated the community to be cold and hard, that's what he would get as well. And so for us, we're going to look this morning at a passage of scripture that talks about a unique time in Israel's history when they were on a journey uh, out of slavery, heading towards the promised land. And when we look at this story today, I want you to have that overarching sense in your mind of people and how it is that they get what they want. Now, most of you will be aware that in the last two years I've done this walk across the top of Spain, done it twice, 800 kilometers, it's called a, a spiritual pilgrimage called the El Camino, the, uh, the Santiago, the, the Way of St. James. And um, I occasionally drop in on the websites that are around and sort of get a feel for what other people are experiencing as they do this walk, as people write about it. And uh, I came across this, this one website, and it said, 10 reasons why the Camino sucks. <laughs> and uh, here's three of the uh, reasons why uh, this person's complaining about how wide the path is, uh, saying that you get to walk alongside traffic at times, and it's noisy, and uh, after hiking on this heavy, hard uh, sidewalk at times, your feet end up like they've been beaten with a meat tenderizer. And so the guy's got another seven examples as to why it is the Camino sucks. One of them is, by the time you get to the end, you've been exposed to so much sun, you should just check yourself into a skin cancer clinic because you're going to die an early death as a result of walking the Camino. Now, this is a classic example of somebody getting what they expect. I walked this walk twice, and sure, the ground is hard. Yes, there are times when you're walking alongside busy traffic and highways, but it's all about what you're looking for, isn't it? And if you expect to have a miserable time, you will get a miserable time. Is that true? There's something about human nature in there that you can identify with? Well, this morning, what we're going to do is we're going to see the story about Israel and how it is that they were called by God to go and explore the promised land, a land promised to their forefather, Abraham. This is a very simple story, one you've probably read before, but uh, I want to grab it for us as a church to help identify for us this sense of season that we're in as a church when we ask the question, who us? So let's go to number 13, and we see here it says that When Moses sent them to explore Canaan, he said, Go up through the Negev and on into the hill country. See what the land is like and whether the people who live there are strong or weak, few or many. What kind of land they they live in? Is it good or bad? What kind of towns do they live in? Are they unwalled or fortified? 
How is the soil? Is it fertile or poor? Are there trees in it or not? Do your best to bring back some of the fruit of the land. It was the season for the first ripe grapes. Now here's the people of Israel, the nation of Israel, poised on the edge of a promised land. God had already been very, very good to them by taking them out of 400 years of slavery, miraculously delivering them from the Egyptian leader, the Pharaoh, uh, leading them through a whole lot of miraculous uh, um, situations, and ultimately God drowned the Egyptian army in the sea as the people crossed over this red or red sea into the Sinai Desert. And so here is an opportunity that God has provided for people to be able to move beyond where they are right now. Now, for a lot of them, they could have said, we're doing pretty well, thanks. We've got food. We've got bread that God provided, manna from heaven. We've got a big pillar of fire that comes into the sky and keeps us warm by night, supernaturally, and a big cloud that covers us over the day so that we don't fry during the heat of the day. And so they could be quite satisfied, couldn't they? But as far as God was concerned, they'd only come halfway. They'd only come halfway. They'd been saved, but saved for what? They'd been saved, but saved for what? And that's a question that we have to ask ourselves on a daily basis, really. I have become a Christian, but what is the purpose that I've become a Christian for? To be saved from the enemy, no doubt. To be saved for eternal life, no doubt. Being saved for the forgiveness of of my sins to glorify God, no doubt. But where does it go from here? The people of Israel were set free for a purpose. Not just to be set free, but they were the people who were going to encapsulate, hold together the glory of God. They were people set apart like no other people on earth who were going to reflect the goodness of God to the nations around the world. And so it's easy for us to look at this story and identify with them because every one of us has a halftime story. Every one of us can stop and look at our lives right now and say, where am I? Am I stuck here at halftime? Is there a few things that I've got to do and got to get on with? Or am I just going to stay in this desert place walking around? So the 12 spies go out to Canaan and they return And this is the account that they give to Moses and the people who are waiting for their return and waiting for their report. It says, they gave Moses this account. We went into the land to which you sent us, and it does flow with milk and honey. Here is its fruit. But the people who live there, they are powerful. And the cities are fortified and very large. We even saw descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites live in the Negev, the Hittites, the Jebusites, and the Amorites live in the hill country. And the Canaanites lived near the sea and along the Jordan. Then Caleb silenced the people before Moses and said, We should go up and take possession of the land, for we can certainly do it. So here's two reports looking at one scenario. And that's a pretty common thing, isn't it, amongst people? You can both experience exactly the same thing and go, I think we can do it, or I don't think we can do it at all. You know, when we we just see uh, film or food critics, somebody goes to a restaurant, comes away and says, that's the worst food I've ever tasted. Somebody else has been there, and it was the best meal I've ever had. Same with a movie. Critics go in and say, that's the greatest movie ever made. Other people say, that was just boring. I don't want any more, I would, would never recommend that to anybody. And so it is that, we have these two reports. Caleb has a a can-do attitude, a spirit upon him, which says we are not going to stay where we are and we won't be defeated because I'm serving a God who has given us a great history, great miracles, great things have happened. And so therefore, Caleb is a carrier of this story. This story has informed him. Whereas for the other folks there, the other 10 spies who reported negatively about this, this uh, land, they, they were living in the present. They didn't carry anything of God's miraculous story with them to the point where they would say, God has, so therefore God will. And it's so important for us to carry the story of what God has done in our lives, in our community, because it's the same God who will stretch us and take us into a place 
where we can be challenged by God when he says, who us? And we say, yes, we can do this. We can go from here. And so here we have Caleb looking at this challenge through the eyes of faith. Bill Hybels wrote uh, a, a, a book and he mentioned it. He mentioned a, a tunnel, a tunnel of chaos, which is a time in our lives when we go through change. Some of you would have been there. Some of you are there right now. The tunnel of chaos. And the problem with the tunnel of chaos, Hybels said, is that when you're going through it, you don't know how long it is. But he said, one thing you can rest assured is if you give up the fight, you're going to get stuck in that tunnel of chaos right where you are and nothing else is going to change. It's been said by the cynics sometimes that uh, uh, due to the energy crisis, the light at the end of the tunnel has been turned off. People have run out of hope. But we're called to be people of faith and therefore when we're going through change, going through crisis or have an opportunity in front of us, it's never that easy, is it? But we have to move forward by faith. Sometimes when we can see what the future looks like and we say, I can see what God is doing. I can see this, this huge building made of oak. How do I know that's going to be the end result? Well, God's given me an acorn. Okay, God has given me something to start. And when we start, that's the day of be small beginnings that we can't despise. We need to make a start and move forward. And so Caleb was of the spirit. He was saying, listen, we are the people of God. We can make it. But the majority were saying, no, we can't. And listen to how it is that they described the land. But the men who had gone up with him, with Caleb, said, we can't attack these people. They're stronger than we are. And they spread among, and they spread among the Israelites a bad report about the land they had explored. They said, the land we explored devours those living in it. All the people we saw there are of great size. We saw the Neph Nephilim there, the descendants of Anak, come from the Nephilim, and we seemed like grasshoppers in our own eyes, and we looked the same to them. So these are the same people who traveled with Caleb, but now they're starting to mythologize what they've seen. They brought back fruit from the land, and it was good. But you see them in the middle of that, uh, that passage there, the second line, it says, uh, or third line, it said, um, the land devours those living in it. Now that's a picture of land that is desolate, maybe dry, maybe drought-ridden. You know, in Australia, over a decade ago, farmers ultimately gave up on farming certain areas of Australia. The lack of water, the lack of resource there, the land literally devoured their animals, devoured their crops, and therefore devoured their livelihood. And so we can see how the illustration is a real one. But the other picture that's there in their mind is one of, of myth and legend. You see, they knew that there had been this large race of people called the Nephilim. It's mentioned in Genesis chapter 6. And so they would have had within their campfire stories and campfire mythology a picture in their minds that one day in their exploration, they might come across the Nephilim, or at least descendants of the Nephilim. And so here they go, and they see these big walled cities, and they see this people group, and they go, surely this must be the land of the Nephilim. We are too small. We just, we're just grasshoppers. So in their mind, in their imagination, they build it up to such a way that they considered this an impossible task. Even though God had brought them through um, many amazing deliverances and miracles, they got to the point where they said, we can't do this anymore. And so therefore they started to live a lie and believed a lie. And how easy that is for us to do, to believe a lie. Proverbs talks about the man who is a farmer. When he looks to the sky, he will not plant a seed because it's going to be too hot. When he looks to the sky, he won't plant a seed because there's going to be a storm. And so what the proverb is telling us is that if you keep looking around you for signs, you will turn those signs into something negative and you will never actually get on with making the task, sorry, getting on with the task ahead of you. And, and it's true, isn't it? We can always find a reason, always find an excuse. It's like the 16-year-old boy who's got a pimple 
He's looking in the mirror and he knows he's going out to a social event that night. And he looks in the mirror and he goes, oh, I've got a pimple. Oh, man, I'm so ugly. Oh, I'll never get a girlfriend. Oh, I'll never get married. I'll never have any children. Oh, I'm going to have such a lonely life. I think I'll go join the monastery. That's true. We've all been teenagers. You know, we can, we can take one little thing and we can start building on it in our imagination, which is essentially what the people of God were doing. They'd forgotten who God was. And Caleb was the only one who was speaking up for God. But we think it's bad now in this story. It gets worse. Let's have a look at this. Because the story continues. That night, all the members of the community raised their voices and wept aloud. Okay, this is a miserable time. All the Israelites grumbled against Moses and Aaron, and the whole assembly said to them, If only we had died in Egypt or in the wilderness. Why is the Lord bringing us to this land only to let us fall by the sword? Our wives and children will be taken as plunder. Wouldn't it be better for us to go back to Egypt? And they said to each other, We should choose a leader and go back to Egypt. That's unbelievable, isn't it? And yet it's perfectly, perfectly a picture of how people can speak up negativity. Isn't it true? Now these guys just went across the land, across the border, checked out this land, and now they're talking about, oh, we should have died. We should have died in Egypt. You know, they're going to take our children, they're going to take our wives. Um, we should get another leader and go back to where we came from. You go, are you kidding me? Is this really how bad it is? This is way beyond bad. This is, this is a case of corporate negativity that is going to pull these people down to a place where they're just going to go back to Egypt and perish under the hand of Pharaoh. And how easy it is for us to sit around in our imaginations thinking, Oh gosh, life was better back there. Uh, even if it was seemed tough, at least we knew what the rules were. At least we didn't have to live by faith. At least if I knew if I put my foot wrong, I'd get a beating. And thank you, Mr. Egyptian slave owner, for giving me a beating because I have security in the fact that I've got a boundary there. There are people who live their lives like that in New Zealand every day. People who cannot escape abusive situations. And they're secure in the fact that... Uh, at least they know the rules. At least they know the rules. And these people were literally stuck in half time, weren't they? Stuck in half time. And for us, we look at this and we say, how could it ever happen that these people could be so stupid as to not see the fact that God was going to lead them? And being stuck in half time is just this, this, this uh, place of human nature. And every one of us here has to stop and look at our own lives and say, as of today, you could call it half time. What are you going to do with your life from here? What are you going to do with your life from here? Um, a few years ago, I read a book. Um, I was in my 40s, and the book was called uh, 20 Good Summers by Martin Hawes. Martin's uh, sort of a personal uh, financial advisor, really. But uh, it was sort of written for people who are 55 and up, saying you've got 20 good summers, you know? 20 good summers where you can be active now. Sorry for any of you who are over 75. I hope you've got another 20 good summers ahead of you yet. But uh, what he's saying is you've got 20 good summers to go out and go hard. Okay? So don't stop and look at your life as if it's nearly all over. If you go back, go back into the 60s, the chances are that you wouldn't have drawn your pension for, for many years before your life would have come to an end. But now, as uh, Bob Buford said, he wrote a book called Stuck in Half Time, he says that we have a third age now. And what are we going to do with that third age? That age from 55 onwards can be our most productive years. But we can get stuck in half time even at the age of 45 or 35 because we think that our best years are behind us. That's an absolute lie of the enemy. And Caleb knew this. He knew that God had more for this group of people than what they actually had any imagination for themselves. They just couldn't realize that God was choosing them. And that's where faith arises, isn't it? It's easy to look around us and say, oh, God chooses other people because other people are better than me and can offer more than me. 
That's an absolute lie of the enemy. That's the lie that was in the camp when the Hebrew people were arguing and moaning and crying and wailing and wanting to go back to Egypt. The simplicity of this is this. God will take our availability and He'll increase our ability to ensure that He gets the glory. That's what God was wanting to do with this nation. And He was going to do it. It was just unfortunate. It cost Him 40 years because this generation chose not to go into the promised land. And they wandered around the desert for 40 years before that generation, that faithless generation, died out. Now, to, to bring this home a little bit more for us as a church, um, a lot of you will be aware that just uh, two months ago, we were presented with an opportunity to purchase a piece of land up on State Highway 2 and behind the, the, uh, the birthing centre there. That's the, that's the birthing centre there. Uh, that's the... Um, right on Dangerous Corner, that's right. Um, that's the other thing there. I don't know what that is. Um, oh, it's a preschool, isn't it? Montessori. Okay, so, so here we are, and we've got an opportunity. Now, I'm not going to reveal anything today. We're still in process. Uh, but the big challenge for us is to get our head in the game first. That's what the challenge was for the people of Israel. They had to get their head in the game. And to get your head in the game, you have to stop and say, firstly, could God be calling us as a church to a place where we put a stake in the ground and we say, this is half time. This isn't full time. Just because we've got lovely buildings and a mission program and great things happening, this doesn't mean we just perpetuate what we've got already. This is half time. And God is calling us to break into something, a whole new series of arenas that we haven't um, done as, as much as what God would like us to do. Areas where we're going to affect the community. Like this church, I'm very grateful, has a really positive reputation within our city and with it, particularly within our local area here. You know, it's, I, I think we're at a stage, if we disappeared overnight, we would be missed because of the things that we do and the things we bring. And so it's very easy to camp out on that reputation and say, hey, that's, that's cool, it's great to be part of Bethlehem Baptist Church. But God's looked at us and he said, here is an opportunity and this calls this season half time. And we have been called to step up and we can embrace things in our community that are giants in our land, that are giants in our land. And we are going to be given the chance to wrestle with those giants. Because what we're looking to do above all things is to make a greater connection with our community. We're not looking and dreaming and praying about a, a nicer auditorium with lazy boy seats for each of us. Okay, We're not looking for a, you know, a better quality this, that or the other. God is calling us to engage. Otherwise, we just become a club with a fancy, fancier clubhouse. Okay? So the giants that we've got to wrestle with are things like family breakdown. How can we make a difference with what we are doing? How can we engage with the areas of mental health? How can we, how can we help our society, our young people who are struggling with depression, uh, struggling with bulimia, struggling with mental health issues that can cause suicide. How do we wrestle with these giants? The more that faith is being taken out of the community, the more that faith in the Christian story is being taken out of our society, the higher the rise of depression is. Quite simply, our story has changed, hasn't it? Our story as Western society has changed. Our story was that we were people being led by God a people who are created by God, a people who are created for a purpose, saved, forgiven, redeemed, and our opportunity was to create and recreate more of the same. But because our story is now a secular story, we're told that we have evolved by crawling out of the swamp. Okay, You have no intrinsic value at all. You know, If you live or die, you have no greater value than a toad on the road. Therefore, our story has changed and people grow up with the sense in which, what is it all about? Who am I? What is my life? Does it count? Does it have any meaning? Does it have any value? Does it have any future? And as we in society are having our story changed underneath our feet, the end result is that if you sow the wind, you'll reap the whirlwind. No wonder depression and the likes is causing such a problem in this country. Do you understand? 
So our responsibility is to remind people who has, whom they are, whom they belong to. Mental health issues, issues like suicide. How do we deal with child poverty? That's one of the big giants in the land, isn't it? How do we deal with uh, the blending of our society as more migrants come in and become the new New Zealanders? How do we embrace these people? How do we embrace the strangers as the Bible talks to us about encouraging and strengthening our society? And, um, and of course, one of the, the other big giants in the land this week is Winston Peters. I don't know what we're going to do about him, but I just thought while we're talking about giants, I thought I'd put it out there. You see, what I'm saying here is that as a church, God has bigger dreams for us than we have for ourselves. God is looking over the River Jordan and he's encouraging us to embrace an opportunity. And I just want to encourage you to keep praying for us uh, as we're just trying to test the waters on, on what it is that we can do on this piece of land and how it is that we can give the kingdom the most amount of impact for this opportunity. And so over the next you know, five or six weeks, we've, we've asked for 10 weeks. We've got another five or six weeks to go on that. We want to be able to uh, melt down our options. We're going to limit our options by eliminating some of the options and bringing it back down to a picture of what it is we feel that God is saying to us. So please, we all need your prayers. We want to approach this with the same spirit that Caleb did, this opportunity. And uh, that's a can-do, God will, God is with us attitude. I just want to finish off also this morning by, by reminding us about whom we are as the church as we push out into this church planning endeavor with Golden Sands. I was reminded starkly this week uh, through a letter that was given to me that was being handed around to the, um, the ministers of a large denomination within our country. And this letter gave instructions to the ministers on how to close their churches. How to close their churches. And within the letter it's saying that it seems that the season of Christianity has now passed us by. Here is how you close your church. If you need to. And they had a whole lot of figures and numbers and where you get to and what you should do. And then, then, and then an explanation to these leaders saying, We'll be able to look after you in some fashion. But this is how you close your church. And I'm listening to this and I'm going, reading this, and I'm like, how on earth is this person on the same planet as me? You know, this person's one of these people who would have been moaning, going back, saying, let's go back to Egypt. This person's a, a leader within their denomination, a leader who is just saying the days are, of the church are over. And I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. We're only just beginning. God's always about something fresh, always about something new. We've just got to capture the wind of the Spirit, don't we? And uh, we'll be reminded that Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not stand against it. That's pretty simple stuff, isn't it? It's not complicated. I could talk to the children's ministry about that and they'd go, yep, we understand what you're saying. As we pray, as we lean into God, he will build his church. He will take the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. You know? And, and, and quite simply, quite simply put, the church is a sign and a wonder. It's a mystery to most people to think that whom we are and what we do all comes out of a, an understanding of faith. Who we are and what we do is a result of what God has done in our lives. And the transformation that we can bring to society is still out there waiting for us to tap into it and to walk into it. And that's what I know God is calling us to. And that, to me, is worth crossing the Jordan for. It's worth standing up against those negative naysayers, the cup half full types, and saying, you know what? On my own, I can't do a thing. But together in God, we can achieve things that will just blow our own mind away. And so I'm excited about that. So I ask the question, who us? Who us? Yes, us. Who else is it going to be? It's the old story. If not who, if not you, then who? If not now, then when? Okay? Another lifetime? How many of you got another lifetime to live? Okay? See, Donna, you're on your own when it comes to that Buddhist thing, you know. So I want to leave that with us.
a big challenge. Let's, let's move forward with that spirit of Caleb. Okay? Let's see the opportunity. Let's embrace it willingly. And let's put Jesus Christ firmly, firmly, solidly on the map in the city. Why don't we stand? Let me pray for us. Father, as we, as we lean into you, we might feel that we just hold an acorn in our hands. An acorn which is a seed of faith, and yet you call us to build something that resembles the work of a mighty oak. Lord, help us to have a right spirit about us when we look at the future and anticipate how it is that you could be choosing us and using us to do things that we never expected to do. For some of us, Lord, our story is one of escaping Egypt, having got out of a life that was destructive and sinful. And we've been given the opportunity to put our two feet on the ground. And we celebrate that as a a great place to be. But you call us beyond this, Lord. You call us to a place that is fruitful, a place that promises much place that is transformational, a place that is on the other side of the river, a place that is in the cup half full category. And we look forward to, Lord, your leading in this. And I just encourage you, Lord, to to inspire us with prayer, to lift up to you the opportunities that can be, to ensure that we don't get stuck in half time. So, Lord, as you have been, continue to be gracious to us. Continue to lead us and give us the confidence to trust in you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey, for some of you, when I'm talking about half time, you might be feeling that as an individual, you're there right now. You're sort of stuck and you're going, is life all about just repeating the patterns that I've had in the past? You know, or, or do I, am I looking and feeling in my spirit that I need a change, I need a breakthrough, something that just is going to set me on a new pathway. And you know that God's been encouraging you and you felt a bit anxious about it, maybe a bit fearful. Well, I just want to invite our prayer team to come to the front and, um, and they'll just be there to stand with you and pray with you so that there's an opportunity for you to join them uh, and just have them agree with you in prayer. That would be cool, wouldn't it? So don't let the opportunity go by.